Well, a little review. Um, last week we looked at the definition of freedom and we said that it was um, being able to be who God wanted us to be and do what God wanted us to do. We looked at an <clears throat> at, um, important event timeline, um, really relational timeline, creation, the fall, the flood, the Tower of Babel, uh, uh, the covenant between Abraham or uh, between God and Abraham, the establishment of Israel, uh, Jesus coming, and then the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost. And, and we talked about how God was the same through all of these things. There was, um, so when you look at him at creation, he's the same God at the crucifixion. And um, then we looked at the relationship between God and man at creation. And, and we looked at how it was like a parent-child relationship. Uh, Susie, there are some um, some tablets in the back, if, if you want, for taking notes and stuff. Um, and we saw how how sin and sin nature uh, put this huge divide between a holy God and sinful man, and how because of that we weren't able to experience the um, freedom that God had intended at creation. The good news is that we'll be able to experience that later on in heaven. And also, there is a freedom that we can't experience now, today. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking more and more at that freedom. Um, did anybody uh, uh, think about the homework that we had for this past week, thinking about all the things that God had done in order to establish Israel? <laughs> yep, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. He had to keep a remnant of his people throughout. Yeah, and actually, more than just a remnant. I mean, he grew a whole nation. You can almost look at at Egypt like a like a nursery. And because this whole nation grew up under, under their protection in a lot of ways. Anybody have any idea how many, how many Israelites actually came out of Egypt? About two and a half million. There's not a, a specific number that people have come up with, but they know that there were about 600,000 um, men uh, that were of age to be soldiers. And so if you had one parent and one wife and one child as an average, that's two and a half million people. So just to give you some inkling on, on the magnitude of what, of what grew up in, in Egypt under that protection. Also, when you look at them, they really didn't have a religion at that time. Um, and they didn't have a government at that time. So there, in a lot of ways, they were kind of a blank slate. Um, how did they get to Egypt? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. And, and before that, Joseph was actually sold into slavery into Egypt. It's kind of fascinating that Joseph goes in as a slave and then rises to the second highest official in all of Egypt. And then they end up as slaves at the end. So, so it's an interesting uh, trail that they took. And in between, of course, when Jacob went to Egypt, um, they, um, he went in as an honored guest. He was given land, and he also purchased land, which is interesting because at that time there was famine, 
and even Egypt had a lot of famine. And the Egyptians actually first they sold their animals in order to have food. And then they sold their land to the Pharaoh in order to have food. And then Joseph let them use their land and help them to, um, to grow food on that land. And then they had to pay 20% of everything that they, any, everything that they had grown on that land. So most of the Egyptians didn't own land. But the Hebrews in Goshen actually owned their land. So it's kind of a fascinating uh, thing that went on there. What was it like to be an Egyptian or be an Israelite in Egypt? They were enslaved, so. they were enslaved. okay. What's that? There was the work to slave labor throughout the land. Um, they could be beaten. They were in a lot of uh, an awful lot of uh, issues from from uh, their workmasters. What else happened to them? The Egyptians were worried about them um, overpopulating. Yeah. So how did how did they control their population? Yep, they did that. Yes. Well, they were killing their babies. Uh, they, the Egyptians would have, the Hebrews actually, throw their babies, their male babies, in the river. So that's how they were trying to control their, their, um, their population. It is still an interesting situation, though. Um, as bad as they had it, they were slaves in Egypt but they still own their own flocks and herds. Um, I know earlier on, they, uh, they were actually used as a military buffer because of the warring nations to the east. They would have to go through uh, Goshen and the, and the Hebrews in order to get to the Egyptians. So the Egyptians actually used them as a buffer. Um, from the warring nations in the east. Uh, and I never found where either their land was confiscated, and I also never found where they were disarmed. Um, because when they, when they went into the Sinai and they fought the Amalekites, they had weapons. But it doesn't say where those weapons came from, and it never says that they were disarmed to get to that point. So this relationship between the Egyptians and the, and the Israelites was really a strange relationship. Um, they had an awful lot of autonomy, and yet they were slaves. Their children were, were being killed by an oppressive nation. And yet you don't see where they tried to escape. You don't see where they tried to overthrow the Egyptians. It's just a fascinating uh, relationship that they had. <clears throat> um, one of the questions I, I, I couldn't figure out is why they, they hadn't intermarried and, and stuff with the Egyptians. And uh, there are a couple of verses, um, Genesis 46, 34, and Genesis uh, 43, 32. And uh, it talks about how the Egyptians looked at the Hebrews as being um, detestable and because they were herders and uh, shepherds. And in 43, 32, 
they wouldn't even eat with them because they looked at them as detestable. And, and on, on that issue, they think that that was because of religious uh, reasons, that the Egyptians looked down on the, on the Hebrews. Probably, we know that the Egyptians looked down at the Hebrews, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of information that would lead to the Hebrews really looked up to the Egyptians. And the Egyptians were like the superpower in that area. And there are four, four reasons uh, why they were superpowers. First, their agriculture. Their agriculture and their fisheries, they were able to produce more food than they needed to feed their people. So they actually exported food. So it was a source of wealth. Uh, secondly, was their government slash religion. It was a very stable religion. It had gone on for hundreds of years before this point, and it would go on another hundreds of years after this point. And I say government slash religion because the pharaoh was considered a god. So their king was actually, wasn't just a king, he was a god to them. Um, thirdly, they were a wealthy nation. Um, because they exported, they had a lot of monies coming in, and also they would conquer areas and, and take money from that too. The wealth wasn't just in the pharaoh's hands either. It was distributed really throughout the country. There were a lot of bureaucrats. Um, soldiers got paid. There were a lot of craftsmen, farmers. All these people um, had money. So, so it was a pretty wealthy country top to bottom. Um, and fourthly, their army. They had a superior army. They had a professional army. So these soldiers were, that's what they did for a living, is they were soldiers. Uh, most of the places that they, would, that they would fight, they would grab a bunch of farmers and give them clubs and say, go out and go to battle for us. These guys, they, they worked together. They would train together. They would come up with techniques to uh, conquer their enemies. Because they were a wealthy country, they developed all kinds of weapons to go with these professional soldiers. Um, you'll notice that if you see pictures, you see a lot of curved swords and um, curved weapons on the end of poles. Uh, there wasn't a lot of armor back then, so they were, they were used to slash through their enemy uh, rather than stab or, or anything like that. Their bows were lightweight and powerful. Um, they were laminated bows, and it would take up to five months to, to make a bow at that time, so they were very expensive. Um, but they would shoot a substantial amount further than their enemy's bows. So if, if, if you go into battle and you can shoot 50 feet farther than your, your enemy, that is a huge advantage. They also had uh, chariots that were really lightweight and sleek. You may have seen some of the chariots that are heavyweights that would go into battle and they'd try to run people over. These were to get uh, Egyptians to points of battle so they could overcome the enemy at, at a certain point in the battle. Often they would have uh, a charioteer and a spearman or bowman on behind. And, and so they might race a hundred or a thousand chariots to a certain point where the battle is weak. Um, and these, these bowmen could shoot like 25 to 35 arrows per minute. If you can imagine a thousand bowmen shooting 30 arrows a minute, you've got 30,000 arrows going into a weak point or a strong point of the enemy. You can imagine what that would do. So their army was super powerful. This, this, this was the superpower in, in the area. And, and it, it looks like the like the uh, Israelis really looked up to them um, because of all this. And that's where, um, <clears throat> that's where we see the plagues coming in. Um, uh, God raises up Moses to come to Egypt and, and tell him, hey, let my people go. And, and Pharaoh said, I don't know the God of the Hebrews. I don't know the God of the, 
of the Israelis. So, um, so he wouldn't let him go. <clears throat> so Moses uh, was told by God to warn Pharaoh first and, um, and come up with these signs to, so Pharaoh would let his people go. Um, the first plague that they came up with was, was the plague of blood. And where all the Nile in all the bodies of water, all the ponds and canals, everything turned to, turned to blood. Um, and, and some people say that, uh, that this, this could have been flooding from uh, Ethiopia and coming down the Nile, and, uh, which is possible, or maybe God just turned it all to blood. I, I, I tend to actually think that God probably turned it to blood because it was in ponds and it was in jars and it was in all kinds of places that the Nile hadn't gone. So, so in my mind, probably God turned it into blood. And the significant thing is the Egyptians, they worshiped the Nile. So this was, a, this was really a direct attack on the gods of, of Egypt and also on their agriculture because their fisheries, the fish in the, in the river all died. So, so it was an attack on both of those things. Uh, the second one was uh, frogs, the plague of frogs. And there were just huge amounts of frogs that came uh, out of the Nile. And, um, and it's kind of funny in a way because the Egyptians worshiped the frogs. That they were part of the deity. They looked at them as, as deity. And so it's like God was saying, okay, so you want to worship them? I'm going to give you a boatload of them. And uh, these frogs inhabited all their houses, the palace. Everything was just filled with frogs. And then, um, and, and then when they all died off, there were huge piles of dead frogs all over everyone's houses. So you can imagine what that was like. So the first two plagues, there was, there was a direct um, correlation between the gods of Egypt. Uh, the third one, gnats. Uh, gnats just covered Egypt and uh, covered the men there and also the animals and, and it really put a lot of stress on the animals. The fourth one were flies. Flies came in again. They would attack men, put all kinds of stress on the, on the animals. They would lay eggs on them and bite them. And so there was, there was all kinds of issues with the flies. And then the fifth one were, was the plague of livestock. And all the livestock that were outside died in this plague. All the Egyptian livestock did not touch any of the Hebrew or the Israeli livestock. So again, it's an attack on their agriculture. Um, the next one was the uh, plague of boils. And all the animals that were left, the ones that were inside, didn't die. They all got boils. The people got boils. Um, and uh, so another attack on their agriculture. Um, the next one was hail. And God sent hail that they said that there had never been a storm like this storm that they went through. Anything that was outside, any man, any animal was killed by this hail. All of the crops that were growing, I think it was barley and flax at that time, they were all wiped out from this hail. So again, another attack on their agriculture. The next one was locusts. And the locusts came a few months after the hail. And now the, now the wheat and the spelt are starting to grow. The locusts come in and wipe, completely wipe out the wheat and the spelt and uh, all the trees, anything that had green on it at all, they wiped out. Again, another attack on agriculture. Um, and then the next two, there will be a, a real emphasis 
on the gods of Egypt. Um, the next one is darkness. And Ra was the, was the sun god. And, and, Ra, and the sun god in Egypt was their main, their chief god. So it was like Odin or uh, Jupiter, Zeus. That, that, that would be the equivalent of Ra. Um, and God took away the light, blocked out the sun for three days. And, and this one really shook up the, the Egyptians more than anything else because this was their top god, their sun god. Um, enough so that, so that Pharaoh said, okay, the people can go, but you have to leave all the animals because they had lost all their animals. In, in these other plagues, or most of them. Um, but Moses said, no, no, we all are going and we're taking our animals with us. Um, Pharaoh said, no, you're going to stay here. God hardened his heart for that. And then uh, the last plague was the death of the firstborn. And, and what the Israelis did is, is they went through and uh, uh, they sacrificed the lamb, and uh, they they dipped hyssop in, which was a a, a plant that would make like a brush. Um, they dipped that in the blood, and they put it on the on the sides of the doors and above. So it formed something like this. Kind of reminds you of anything? And that was the Passover. And so when the angel of death came through, the uh, Israelites were all protected because of the blood. And the, and the uh, Egyptians lost all their firstborn, including the firstborn of the Pharaoh. So another direct attack on their, on their God. Um, it said, it said that there wasn't uh, a house in all of Egypt that didn't have whaling in it. it. It touched every family in Egypt except the Hebrews. So you look through these, these plagues. Um, we want to look at Exodus 9, 13 through 16. Somebody want to read that? Then Moses said to then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and come from Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of Hebrews, said to the people go, so they had made their motions. Or this time I will send the whole first of my friends to the sea, and send the officials and the people so they know there's no one that can go on there. For by now I will stretch out my hands and strike you and let you go this way. So I tell you, I will let you off with the sword, or you off here. But I have raised you up for this very purpose. I am assuring you of power and permission to be like a complaint in all the earth. Wow. What does that first, what does that tell you in this passage? What's that? Yeah. What else? That God was actually being merciful in this place. He just wiped them all out and let them go. He was just being merciful for those who didn't make their shoes. What else? Absolutely. What do you think the purpose was? It was to demonstrate his power and to show that he was above all the uh, all the Egyptian gods or gods that uh, they had made up, and he was showing that he could do whatever he wanted, and that uh, his was there was none like. Absolutely. 
Anybody else? So he says that he could have wiped out the Egyptians at any time and freed his people. But he chose not to do that. He could have done it earlier on. And the city went through all 10 of these plagues, showing his supremacy and his superiority over all, the, over all their gods and their agriculture. Two of the things that made them so great. Um, Exodus 10, 1 and 2. So we want to read that. So it's talking about two audiences here that God is talking about and, and trying to demonstrate to. What are the two audiences? Yeah. The future generations of Hebrews and to the future generations of Well, and all the earth. Think about what this is going to do to all the enemies of Israel in the future when they see what, what God has done to this superpower. And that's what, that's what he is explaining what he's going to do. And then uh, Exodus 12, 12. Exodus 12, 12 says that I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. So it's it's very it's very apparent what God is is doing that he wants to bring judgment on all, all the gods. Again, I think it's to show the Israelites that God is is sovereign over all of them and that the gods of of uh, Egypt are, they're so, they just really don't exist. Um, the gods of the. I would say because he really granted a lot of grace and mercy towards the Egyptians because he said he could have wiped them out, but he didn't. But then he, you know, but he dealt harshly with the Egyptians except for the gods of the Egyptians. But he also was pretty harsh on the Egyptians too. He showed mercy, but he also showed a lot of harshness. They had been, they had done a lot of evil to God's people. So, so he did show both. Um, so finally, after all this, Pharaoh says, okay, get your people out of here. And, and it had gotten to the point where the Egyptians wanted them out. It wasn't just, okay, you can leave. They, they said, you know, Get out of here. Um, Exodus 3, 22. Now this is before all, the, all of this had started. Somebody want to read Exodus 3? Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so you will fund the Egyptians. And then Exodus 12, 35, 36. This is after the plagues. I want to read that. The Israelites did as Moses instructed, and I asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the people, and they gave them what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptians. Amazing. This wealthy nation is being plundered, not by the Israelites, but by God. God told them what was going to happen before it happened. Did you catch that? He had planned this whole thing out. Several times he hardened 
Pharaoh's heart in order to do this. Show supremacy. Now you see supremacy over their agriculture, over their religion, and over their wealth. He's just plundered this rich nation. Well, we're going to get to the army pretty quick here. Um, so God leads the people out of, out of Egypt by day with a, a pillar of, of smoke and by night with a, a pillar of fire. He leads them out and he leads them to the edge of the Red Sea. An undefendable position. They look out across the plain and they see the Egyptians coming. Pharaoh had changed his mind and they're coming after him with his, the full force of their army. God, that's the army coming. <laughs> so so God, God takes the smoke and the fire that was leading the people and he goes behind the people between the Egyptian army and the Israelites, and he, he doesn't allow them to get together. He spreads the Red Sea, the people go across on dry land, and then he removes that barrier from the Egyptians. The Egyptians race down after the, after the, the Hebrews, and, and calamity takes place then. The wheels on their chariots that they'd just driven across the desert, no problems. The wheels on their chariots start falling off. So it slows them up. So it allows their foot soldiers, their troops, to get to uh, uh, catch up to them. And then God closes the water on them and destroys their whole army. Amazing. This superpower with this great agriculture and and their religion and their wealth and their army has been reduced to a, a, a small portion of what they were. And God did all that. Why do you think he's doing that? That really is a very important He's like, he's showing these strange nations. This is what we make special. Yep. What else? He just gave them a lot of freedom to, to do what he wants them to do now because they're not in Egypt anymore and they're not in slavery. They can go wherever he wants them to go. Yep. What else? What do you think God was doing by doing all this to the Egyptians? By showing his superiority? He's trying to convince the Egyptians of the, you know, that uh, you're following a lot of gods or And probably the, the Israelites. Remember, the Israelites had been there for 430 years. Generations had grown up under Egypt's rule. Do you think, do you think they were starting to, to take some of those gods into their hearts? Okay, so God leads, leads them again by day. Um, with a pillar of smoke by night, by fire. Um, he leads them to a place where there's water, but it's bitter water. And he changes the bitter water to sweet water. Now, and then the next place he takes them, um, they, they want food. And so he provides quail and manna. The next place he takes them, uh, there's no water. Now there's two and a half million people here plus all their herds, plus all their flocks. Imagine how much water they need. There's no water. So God brings water out of a rock. Picture how much water he brings out so they, they quench all the thirst of all the people, all the livestock that are with them. He takes, them, he takes them further and the Amalekites come out to fight them. And, uh, and 
Joshua is sent out to take on the Malachites, and uh, um, Moses raises his arms, and as long as his arms are raised to heaven, they win. As soon as he gets tired and drops them, they start losing. So they ended up propping up his arms, and Joshua wipes out the Amalekites, um, showing that, that it was really God that was doing the, doing the work. They go to Mount Sinai, they get the Ten Commandments, the law is given, they continue on, um, and, and they, they go to the edge of the Promised Land. Now, there were two things that, that the Israelites were supposed to do. They were supposed to be a nation of priests, and they were supposed to inhabit the Promised Land. Those two things. Now you might you might think, well, they were supposed to be God's people, right? I will be your God, you will be my people, right? It's subtle, but there is a difference here. Um, they were already God's people. That happened uh, in the covenant that God made with Abraham. Does that make sense? So, so that isn't who they were to be. That is who they already were. They were God's chosen people. So what they were to do, or who they were to be, were a nation of priests. When they, when they got to, to the promised land. Um, now, the, when they got there, they sent in 12 spies into the Promised Land to see what, what was there. Joshua and Caleb come back and say, hey, this is a great place. God's going to take us for us. Let's get her done. But the other 10 spies come back and say, Oh, yeah, it's a great place, but there are giants. We can't beat them. And that spread through the camp. Um, you want to put up the Exodus... 14, 11 through 12, that whole bunch. Um, these are all, in, in 14, 11 through 12, they were complaining because they said they'd die in the desert. Uh, in Exodus 15, 24, they were complaining because they had bitter water. So they were going to die of thirst. Uh, in, in 14, they were worried. They, they said that the that the Egyptian army was going to kill them. Um, in 16, two, two and three, uh, they said in Egypt they had food, and here they were out in the desert. And God, so they were grumbling about not having food. That's when God gave them the the quail and the manna. In Exodus 17:3. They were complaining and grumbling because they had no water. They, they were, why did God bring them out to the desert to die again? Um, in Exodus 32.1, Moses had gone up on Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. And the, he was gone for 40 days. And so they built a golden calf because they wanted something so they could follow. So they made it out of their own hands, just like the gods in Egypt. So had they, had they drawn from Egypt and on the gods of Egypt? You can see it here with the golden, with the golden calf. Um, in uh, Numbers 11, 4 through 6, 
They were complaining because they had no meat. In Egypt, they had lots of meat. They were given fish for free. In Numbers 14, 1 through 4. Do we have that one? Actual. That would be good. Somebody run and read that. That night, all the members of the community raised their voice to God for God. All the years were complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly listened to them. They no longer made bad news for the wilderness. Why is this bad news to this land? Always let us all die to it. Arise and the children of Egypt, taking us plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt and the same thing to them? We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Oh God, the God of your father said, do not, be afraid, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. Oh, no, this is, this is Genesis. Thanks. Can, can you go back? Yeah. Tell me about this verse. What does it say to you? They were dumb. They were dumb. We're doubting God. Yeah, isn't it amazing? Yep. Yeah. They were looking for someone to take them back to Egypt. It's crazy. Maybe. <laughs> Hard, hard to know how that reunion would be. <laughs> uh, Deuteronomy 1, 30 through 35. Somebody want to read that? And in the wilderness, there, uh, there you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries a son all the way to the land until you reached this place. In spite of this, you did not trust in the Lord your God. Who went ahead of you on your journey in fire by night and in a cloud by day to search out places for your camp and to show you the way that you should go? Again, what picture does this have of God and people? He's patient. Even after all your troubles, he's still with you. What else? Doesn't it remind you of? of the relationship in, at creation between God and man? God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the same God with that parent-child relationship with man at the very beginning, he's showing it here again. It's just amazing. Because they didn't trust God, they were not able to go into the promised land. What do we learn about freedom from this? Okay. What else? What do you see about freedom? What do you learn about freedom? What do you observe about freedom? It's never gotten for free. Like, to get the Israelites free from Egypt. I mean, they had to go through a lot of stuff. Like, a lot of tests, a lot of trials, and a lot of affliction on the Egyptian men just to try and get to a place where they could. Did God know their hearts? Did God know what he was up against here with these people? 
Look at the effort he made to show his supremacy over all that was Egypt. And they want to go back. Amazing. Yeah, what, is, what does this say about freedom? Here, God had, had brought them out of slavery. And I think most people think God had freed them. Right? They weren't free, were they? So what does it say about freedom? Our hearts... You can describe our hearts as a combination between our emotions and our minds. So they, when you see them talk about the heart, think about the, the heart as this combination of our emotions and our minds. Their emotions and their minds were still back in Egypt. Even after all the things that God had done, he had showed them in every way, I am trustworthy. You can trust me. What's that? Follow me. Follow me. Yep. He said it over and over again. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Yep. Um, Exodus 20, 19 and 20. Somebody want to read that? And, and say to Moses, speak to us yourself, and we will listen. We do not have God speak to us, but we will die. Remember what we saw in the garden at the fall? Adam was afraid. These people were afraid. They were afraid of God, but they feared the giants. They, had, they feared uh, the the, the uh, uh, Egyptians, they feared everything else, but they were afraid of God. Rather than fearing God, having that awesome respect for God, they feared everything else and were afraid of God. Kind of an amazing situation after all that he had brought them through, after he'd carried them like a child. was all lost, though, at, at this point. All this effort that God had put in, all these little intricate things that he had done to bring them to the promised land. Um, Deuteronomy 8.2. Somebody want to read that? Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. Who's he talking to here? Which ones, though? See, these were, these were the children of the ones who came out of Egypt. All their... Everyone over 20, except for Caleb and Joshua, died in the desert. This is their children. And God said that, he, that they were out in that desert. They were out in the wilderness for 40 years so he could test what? 
so he could test their hearts. He wanted to see what was in their minds and their, in their emotions. He wanted to see what was in their hearts. Did they trust him or not? Again, what does this say about freedom? Joshua 24, 31. Somebody want to read this? This is talking about that generation, the ones who wandered in the desert for 40 years. Somebody want to read this? Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua, and the elders who outlived him, and the, and him who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. They were able to be who God wanted them to be, they were able to do what God wanted them to do. Hints about that. God had tested their hearts. So where were their hearts? So all this that he went through wasn't so much for their parents. He knew all the issues they were going to Come up against, right? Absolutely. One of the things that I that's fascinating is how many how many men of army age were there that came out of Israel or that came out of Egypt? Six hundred thousand. You know how many there were at the end of the forty years in the desert? Six hundred thousand. Same amount. It's kind of a fascinating aspect. What are your thoughts on this? The Bible is like pretty complete. That sometimes like the people uh, struggle, like for, for the whole time in the desert, um, that struggle can produce a lot more change in us, lasting change than um, just like gifts. And if you look at it, like them getting out of Egypt, it was all visually way more miraculous than just wandering around the desert. physically experienced that themselves. <laughs> yeah. Is, and also all those people who wanted in the desert, they would have had no kids coming out of Egypt, so they experienced all of it. Exactly. So you had to struggle, even though we hated it, they didn't enjoy it. Um, we know that they produced a lot more lasting change. Uh, it's shows human nature that when trade uh, uh, freedom for a little bit of security or sense of uh, safety and then still to the day that's how it can go sometimes. Proverbs talks about the dog going back to its own vomit. Right? I feel like it also we're a very selfish people. We always think about us. We think about us Sure, it's about us, but future generations from now, too, you know, we got to look at the big picture instead of just focusing on our own selves. What, what, are, uh, what are some things that we've learned about freedom from seeing what happened here with the Exodus? Yeah. Um, 
What's that? Great point. Thanks. Anything else? So like fleshly desires? <laughs> and we don't want trials. We don't want the victories. Yeah. Yeah. What else do we learn about freedom from this? It shows how we can be in a physical state of freedom while allowing our minds to still hold those hostages and not utilize that freedom. Our freedom does not depend on our circumstances. I think it's probably one of the biggest things that we see in this. Because God brought them out of slavery, but they still weren't free. Well, no, you, I think you were hitting on a real key aspect of that, about how they were still enslaved in their hearts. Like when they were in Egypt, they were also physically enslaved. Right. Their hearts could have been as free as they wanted, but they weren't as free to serve God because of their physical state, which isn't so applicable to us anymore. It's not so much of a physical freedom. Well, not America, but yeah. And and even here, there's all kind of bondage that we end up in. But it's not about the freedom that God has for us is not about our circumstances. It's about the condition of our hearts and it's about the relationship. That's what we've seen through through all of this so far, about how much the relationship matters. That was one of the things I wanted to point out too, is so often we think of the New Testament as this loving uh, part of the uh, Bible, and the Old Testament is the law, you know, this harsh part of the law. But we see, we see the love and tenderness that God had all through the Old Testament too. And it, it, it comes out so clearly in so much of this. And I, I think it's not um, to be taken lightly that, that the relationship that we have here with God in, this, in the Old Testament the relationship that they had with, with God determined their freedom. It's an important point that we'll touch on later on. So many of the things that we've kind of raced over, and, and I know here we're talking about freedom. Really, we spent most of the time talking about relationships. As we go on, hopefully we'll, we can connect those a little bit better. Any, any more comments or yeah. Just like you're saying, though, it's if you trust God and you don't have these other uh, issues, you don't have to worry about the other things. So there, 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 there's a freedom that you get there. So that's, that's it. Yep. Anybody else? I was just thinking that, you know, when we're talking about they were physically not free before, but maybe, you know, I'm just comparing it to sometimes how you can. You can be like, oh, if only, if only, you know, if we weren't in Egypt, then we could worship God, but really could just been like, I mean, I'm not saying that happened, but you know where that happens all the time. Oh, yeah. People do, if only, if only this, then I could, you know, and so it's really a lot of times just that we always are making excuses. If only I had different parents. If, if only I lived someplace else. 
If only I had a different spouse. If only I had this. If only I had that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yep, I'll be free when this happens. Yep. We're going to be covering a lot more of that in the future. Actually, next week, we'll be getting into the New Testament. So, any anything else? It's, uh, it's like, it's cool to see how things in the Genesis and Exodus affects uh, the New Testament and the Revelation through just the passage of it. And it's, and it's cool to see how that happens. Absolutely. And there's so much that we didn't have time to cover. So it's pretty neat too to see everything that God did. I mean, all the detail work, all the very intricate orchestration of all these different things in order to get us from what happened in the garden in the fall to now, you know, that like you said, next week we're gonna be in the New Testament and Jesus just for Jesus to even be born and to walk the earth and to be able to do what was necessary for our salvation. Like everything you talked about today with Israel was an integral part of that. Like there wasn't anything that happened with Israel where that wasn't on God's mind as the directional I was going. And just how much that actually entailed and how much planning went into it, how much time and all these different things is pretty remarkable. Yeah, it, yeah, it just, a correct, word to use would be awesome, you know, <laughs> because of seeing what God did through all this. And, and all the, like you said, all the little things. Like, I have to believe that God put it in the Egyptians' minds that the Hebrews were detestable in order to protect them. So somehow, he did that years earlier for the whole country to feel that way by the time the Hebrews got to to Egypt. I mean, those are the those are the little things. The burning bush was amazing to me. It was at Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb. Um, God spoke to Moses out of this bush. He trained him on how to act and react in his presence. He said, "Take off your sandals. This is holy ground." So. Just to see how God prepared Moses in that way. So when he came to Mount Sinai and the whole top of the mountain's on fire, he was okay with that. He understood because God had already trained him to be there. You know, there's just so many things in this that we can look at and be amazed at on what God did through all of this.